Good evening, everybody. I'm going to start by saying, where are we now? What is going on? This is almost a sort of phony war situation because there has been a vote to leave the EU and our <coughs> Prime Minister has told us that Brexit means Brexit. But what does Brexit means Brexit mean? When will Article 50 be triggered? Will it be triggered at all? So I would sort of draw an analogy with the phony war of 1939 to 1940 when something momentous seemed to happen, but actually nothing very much happened for about eight months or so, except that there was a change of government in that time and a new Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, and we've, I think, gone through a change of Prime Minister recently. So, and um, although there was a phony war, um, things did hot up quite considerably afterwards as well. So maybe that will happen. So what I'm going to do is to talk for the next 25 minutes or so about some particular issues that relate to the constitutional aspects of bre Brexit. And um, I'll take that quite broadly, actually. Um, our constitution is a rather mysterious affair anyway. Nobody quite knows what it means. And so I'll talk about quite a lot of things. And I'm going to start by talking about the referendum. Now, we've all been through this referendum, but referenda haven't actually figured very largely in UK constitutional law. They haven't been a huge part of our constitution. And that means we don't really know quite what are the constraints, what are the laws that surround them. Our referendum was instituted by an ordinary act of parliament, the EU Referendum Act 2015. And if we contrast our situation to other countries, European countries, for example, those countries have particular constraints on how referenda may be held. For example, they might place thresholds, voting thresholds, how many people have to vote for a referendum to be put into practice, um, and also requirements for majorities, a 60% majority, for example. We don't have anything like that. Uh, and that raises a question of, well, what does it mean if a fairly slender majority votes in favour of something? Particularly in the instance that we know that the referendum is advisory only. It's not binding. Because it was instituted by an act of parliament, um, it could be reversed by an act of parliament, there is nothing in the EU Referendum Act to require its results be put into force. Contrast that to the rather infamous AV referendum held um, a few years ago, where there would have been consequences for a vote. So that's the first thing, that the referendum is a bit of a mystery almost in British constitutional law, because it hasn't played such a big part in it. Now, I move on to this infamous Article 50, um, an article that nobody really thought about or said much about till recently, and now it seems that everybody is talking about it. What is it? What does it do? It finds its place in the Treaty of Lisbon, 2009. Now, before 2009, there was actually nothing in EU law concerning the possibility that a member state of the EU might actually want to leave. And in the earlier constitutional treaty, the EU's draft constitution, which failed in 2004, this possibility was canvassed. Um, because some people had actually said, no, it's not possible for a member state of the EU to leave. And others said, well, this is ridiculous because, of course, politically they could leave. So this clause was drafted. And now we have it. And it found its way into the Treaty of Lisbon. And here we have a picture of a rather younger looking Gordon Brown actually signing the Treaty of Lisbon. Now, Article 50, I'm not going to put it up here. It's a bit convoluted, not very long, a bit sketchy as well. 
it's not very clearly drafted, and part of the problem, I think, is that actually nobody thought it was ever going to be used. The idea that a state might want to leave the EU wasn't really taken very seriously. So now we have problems understanding what it might mean. What does it mean exactly? Now, we're still in this sort of phony war stage because we are talking about triggering a notification to the EU itself that Britain actually wants to withdraw because a vote for leave in the referendum isn't sufficient to count as formal notice. So formal notice has to be given to the EU itself. But right now there's a big argument going on about, well, what is formal notice? Because in the very first paragraph of Article 50, there is a statement that says, any member state may decide to withdraw from the Union in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. The EU isn't going to tell the UK what its constitutional requirements are. That's fair enough. It shouldn't be doing that. It's for the UK to decide that. But interestingly, we discover that the UK is not very clear about what our constitutional requirements are. How do we actually trigger this notice? What should be done? And I've tried to keep it simple by just noting down four possibilities, which you probably can't read very clearly, certainly not at the back, and I'll quickly take you through them. But actually, I think there are more than four. The first possibility is that notification under the UK Constitution is a matter for the Prime Minister, or at least for the executive, for the government, using the prerogative, the royal prerogative, um, and this is a sort of fiction, really, that the Prime Minister can take certain actions which are legal on behalf of the Crown. And in the foreign policy domain, when it comes to concluding treaties, it has very often been a matter of the prerogative. So it's been assumed in the context of the Brexit that this formal notification is simply something that the Prime Minister goes along and triggers. David Cameron earlier said he'd do that the day after the vote if it was a vote for leave. He didn't. And Theresa May has not done it yet. But as far as I understand it, the government legal service is taking the view that this is what should happen. But we have an evolving constitution in the UK. So for the Prime Minister simply to go along to Brussels and say, I formally withdraw, is not enough, according to some constitutional experts. They suggest other possibilities. One is to say, well, our constitution, particularly the prerogative, which is actually a very undemocratic thing when you think about it, that the government can do all sorts of things without parliamentary say-so, uh, the prerogative is controlled by other matters. Some say we have constitutional conventions. Parliament has to have a say and convention dictates that Parliament should be able to vote on this. If you think back to um, the vote in Parliament on Syria as to whether British troops would be <coughs> committed there, that was one such example. So that's one suggestion. But when we get on to possibility three, we have another example which is actually being litigated in our courts as I speak, and I think actually the case is being heard today. And this argument says that it's not enough for the Prime Minister to go along and say to Brussels, we want to withdraw. There has to be an act of Parliament first. Not only does Parliament have to give its consent, it's got to actually legislate to say, we will leave the EU. Why does Parliament say that? Well, it says that because EU law has given rise to rights which every EU citizen, and thus every British citizen, has. These have been incorporated into our national law by the European Communities Act, an act of Parliament. And the argument is that triggering our withdrawal through Article 50 renders that a nullity. It renders the European Communities Act a nullity. It renders those rights a nullity. 
Therefore, there must be another Act of Parliament at this stage. That is being litigated right now. It will be interesting to see how that turns out. Fourth suggestion, and I'm sorry the print is so small, um, but the fourth suggestion brings in the devolved governments. It suggests that it's not enough for withdrawal to be notified to Brussels without the consent of the devolved nations, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales. And Scotland, I think, is particularly significant in this regard, not least because Theresa May, one of the first actions she took was to go to Edinburgh and talk to Nicola Sturgeon and to emphasise the need to find a UK-wide solution. Now, the referendum itself did ma made no provision for any sort of super majority, any requirement that each of the four nations of the UK should vote to leave in order for a leave vote to be valid. Contrast this to other jurisdictions where there are such requirements. Australia, for example, in its um, written law, requires each, um, each province to um, each territory to vote in a particular way. We don't have that in the UK. Whether this argument will succeed or not is interesting. I'm going to come back to it at the end of my talk to highlight other ways in which devolution can have an impact on all of this. And now if I can handle all of this equipment, I'm going to <laughs> move on. Um, assuming that somehow somebody triggers this notice under Article 50, the question then is, what happens next? Because that's when the phony war stops. That's when things really get interesting. And here we have a section of Article 50. It's the second paragraph. And I'm going to read it out because there are a couple of things that need highlighting here. The first is that it says that in the light of the guidelines provided by the European Council, the Union shall negotiate and in conclude an agreement with that state, namely the UK, setting out the arrangements for its withdrawal, taking account of the framework for its future relationship with the Union. Now, this is this rather sketchy Article 50, but a reading of this suggests that actually it's not one, but two agreements that we're looking at. One is going to be the withdrawal agreement, and that's what everybody's actually talking about right now. That will be a rather technical matter, but it will deal with things like um, the UK budget's contributions, how do they cease, um, research grants and other payments that the UK would be getting from the EU in the next few years, how to deal with that. The very important question of acquired rights. What about EU citizens living in the... UK right now, how do we deal with their rights? Uh, what about MEPs? What about the judge at the European Court of Justice? All of these things will have to be dealt with in this withdrawal agreement. But in addition to that, we need to know about future trading relationships with the EU. And that will be a second agreement. That won't be dealt with in this withdrawal agreement. And that's why this could be quite a long, drawn-out business in order to regulate the UK's relationship, its future relationship with the EU. Because if you read this, what it says is, setting out the arrangements for its withdrawal, taking account of the framework for its future relationship with the Union. Taking account of it. What does that mean? It's not clear. But this is not going to be very fast. And also, it's probably going to require unanimity. So there's a difference there, because the actual withdrawal agreement that deals with the technical matters, I'll come back to this, just needs a majority of member states. Future trading relationship, I think, will need all of the states to agree. Who will do this negotiating? Well, the European Council is setting out guidelines the Commission will deal with this on a daily basis, but I'm sure the states, the member states, are going to be very, very concerned about this. 
And the council has appointed somebody called Didier Seuss, who is a former Belgian diplomat, um, but has also worked as chief of staff for the former president of the European Council, um, Van Rompuy. So he's very, very experienced. I did have a picture of him, but it's somehow not found its way onto the PowerPoint. Uh, he is somebody who looks incredibly young for his years, but he is over 50, I believe, and very experienced. So he will have an important role in this. But eventually, this withdrawal agreement will have to be agreed by the Council of Ministers and also by the European Parliament. And that's important because the European Parliament is asserting its authority. It has to consent to this. And um, the fact that Nigel Farage went along and gave a, a rather acerbic talk there may not have done us any favours. So that's what starts to get in motion once this has been triggered. Okay, what can and what can't be negotiated? Well, I've already suggested that there's a bit of a problem with two agreements because there's the withdrawal agreement, the technical stuff, just getting us out of the EU, ceasing to pay the budget, stopping sending MEPs, all of that. But there's also future trade <coughs> relations. And if you read the papers, if you look at the media, that's really what everybody's talking about. Our Minister for Brexit, David Davis, is already talking about this, talking about other possibilities for trade agreements. And the question is, well, what are we likely to get? Because this is an interesting question. I am not a trade lawyer, I'm a constitutional lawyer, so I'm going to move quite swiftly through this. Um, but the first thing I would say is that the EU cannot give to Britain anything it doesn't have the competence to give. The EU is a creature of its treaties. It only has the powers it has been accorded in its treaties. And so David Davis, for example, prior to the referendum, um, you can find some of his talks on Conservative homepage, had suggested that Britain might negotiate a bilateral trade agreements with other EU countries, Germany, for example. This isn't possible. When you're in the EU, you have to engage with the EU as a whole. You can't form your own trade agreements. So cut that out for a start. <laughs> I, I think also that some particular examples that have been held up as possibilities. The EU's agreement with Turkey, for example, is not a particularly encouraging agreement because there is a customs union in that case, which would mean that the UK would not be able to enter its own trade agreements. That doesn't seem to be what Britain would want. The EU-Swiss agreement also, I think, is not very attractive, or the EU-Canada agreement, both of which do not allow for sufficient free movement of services. And we know that financial services and the free movement of financial services is something important for Britain. So I think that what we're really thrown back on are two possibilities. One is the European economic area, and one is some sort of ad hoc um, singular agreement um, possibly just on the basis of the WTO. Personally, I think there are advantages to the EEA. It's an off-the-peg agreement. It already exists, the so-called Norway option. And one of the advantages is that it could be done quite quickly. Um, insecurity, uncertainty is pretty damning, really, for our situation right now. And this could be done quite quickly, so there would be legal security for experts from the UK to the EU and vice versa. Reduces uncertainty. Interestingly, the UK, as a member of the EU, is already a member of the EEA. So there is a question as to whether it would have to go through a difficult process to join it if it's already a member. It might be quite simple. Um, the EEA doesn't include the common customs tariffs. So it would leave the UK free to sign its own trade deals with other countries. 
Um, the EEA doesn't cover the, com com the common agricultural policy, um, the common fisheries policy, tax policy, foreign policy, criminal law. The parts of EU law that tend to be the most controversial and difficult. So in a sense, if Britain joined the EEA, it would be rather like going back to the old EEC prior to about 1993 in the Maastricht Treaty. Um, so it might satisfy some people. The problem with the EEA, and there are some limitations, I think are, are three. Firstly, Britain would have to accept free movement of persons. And some people appear to have voted leave because they didn't like too much immigration. There may be our ways around that, safeguards, emergency breaks that exist under EEA law but don't exist under EU law. Secondly, um, Britain would have to accept EU laws which become part of the EEA without having a chance to vote on them itself. That doesn't sound so good. And in the discussion running up to the referendum, uh, that was suggested as a good reason not to follow the <coughs> Norway option. But in answer to that, one might say, well, you have more choice as to whether to accept those laws. For a start, there are going to be a lot less of them. You're not going to have laws on agriculture, and you're not going to have laws on fisheries, you're not going to have the criminal law if you don't want it, and so on, so a lot less. Secondly, any law that is accepted isn't directly effective. It won't take effect immediately. It will have to be incorporated. It will have to be agreed to. So there is a difference. The third argument that was made against the EEA concerned budget contributions. Norway makes budget contributions. EEA countries do. And I think in that regard, one simply has to say, is it worth spending some money in order to reap the benefits of the single market? And that's a question that people can decide for themselves. So that's the EEA. If, if we don't do that, then what are the possibilities? World Trade Organization as default, possibly. Um, here we have a WTO Liberia agreement. Um, not a very big country, Liberia, but it did take many, many years to form uh, an agreement with the WTO. It's not necessarily a straightforward <coughs> matter. I'm going to skip through this because I'm not a WTO expert. I'm not a trade lawyer. Uh, but from what I understand, there are difficulties in forming um, agreements with the WTO, not least the amount of um, negotiations that would have to be engaged in. And a very serious problem is that we don't have the negotiators because the EU has been doing all of those trade deals for us. So we are rather depleted in terms of trade negotiators and lawyers who could do these deals. As for the suggestion that Britain could go totally duty free, which some people, for example, Patrick Minford have suggested, well, think about that. That means no tariffs on anything, no protection for anything, for steel, for agriculture. Um, how would some of our industries feel about that? Think about the Tata steel debacle. I don't think they would be very happy. So these are some of the possibilities. Moving on. It's not just trade. It's not just goods that we're concerned about. It's people. And perhaps this is the most important, most controversial issue. If Britain leaves the EU, what will happen to EU citizens leaving, living here? And what will happen to UK citizens who are resident in other EU countries? These people have moved... Um, exercising their rights under EU law, expecting these benefits to be permanent. They had no reason not to expect that. Can their rights be secured? This is a very, very difficult issue. I personally think the only way their rights can be secured is in the context of some withdrawal agreement under Article 50. If it isn't written down in the context of that agreement, then there is no other aspect of law that can actually secure them. So the withdrawal agreement, what goes on once Article 50 is triggered, 
is going to be incredibly important. International law doesn't give a great level of protection for acquired rights. This is a principle that is mentioned in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And the Leave campaign said, oh, people will get protection under the Vienna Convention for acquired rights. Not necessarily so. And I'm happy to go into the details of that if anybody has questions later, but I won't go into that now. Um, so acquired rights, very, very important. What is negotiated in this withdrawal agreement? Um, aside from that, the European Convention on Human Rights offers some protection for those who have uh, migrated to another EU state. We, Britain, are still members of the European Convention, so it still applies. I suppose we might question how long we will continue to be members of the European Convention. Our Prime Minister in the past has not proved herself to be a great friend to the European Convention on Human Rights, which is a completely different organisation from the EU, set up under a different body, but all EU member states are parties to the European Convention. But Theresa May in the past has suggested that Britain should leave the European Convention, although interestingly, more recently, she has not been suggesting that. Um, so we will see. Currently, Article 8 of the European Convention offers a degree of protection, the right to private and family life. Um, so while we are members, there is a little bit of protection there. Um, second point, I've also mentioned asylum uh, migration for non-EU um, migrants. And you might think, well, why is that of any relevance when we're talking about the EU? It's not really of any great relevance except for one aspect, which is that currently Britain can control um, the non-EU refugees, people who seek asylum in the UK, except that there is a system under EU law which states that if um, asylum seekers have come into the EU, they should claim asylum in the country they first entered, um, which may be Greece, for example. If we leave the EU, we can no longer send asylum seekers <coughs> to their point of first entry. So leaving the EU actually has a knock-on effect for asylum and refugee claims. Okay, approving the final deal. So, uh, Article 50 gives two years for the UK to agree a withdrawal treaty um, with the EU unless by unanimous agreement the other states agree to extend that time limit. Otherwise, we are out without a deal. But if we do get a deal, who has to agree it? Well, here we have a picture of the Council of Ministers. So the political ministers of the member states, 20 out of 27 of them, by a qualified majority vote, have to sign up to this deal. But before they do that, the European Parliament has to consent to the deal. And uh, no prizes for guessing who that is. Uh, I'm not quite sure who that is with the... <laughs> um, but obviously upset. Um, but... <laughs> The European Parliament has to agree. And I don't know, does anybody know who this is? No. Alan Smith. He is a Scottish member of the European Parliament who got up shortly after Nigel Farage gave his speech. And he said that Scotland had been a supportive member of the European Parliament and urged the European Parliament and the EU not to ignore Scotland. And I put the picture there because if the European Parliament has to assent to this deal, it will be interesting to see what parties such as Scotland might do. Although there is a prohibition on the UK taking part in the Council deal, there's no prohibition on UK MEPs. So Scottish or Northern Ireland or whoever can play their part. So Scotland might have a role in this. It's, one shouldn't forget that. What happens if there's no agreement after two years? Well, that could be rather sad. I think 
Perhaps the saddest would be something I've already mentioned, that we would not secure protection of acquired rights. And I think that's so important for the many EU citizens who are resident working here and for the British nationals who are resident working in other EU countries. They are lawfully here, they came here with legitimate expectations of their situation being protected. And all of us working in different fields, I'm sure we all have colleagues, I'm certainly working in a university myself, I have many, many EU national um, colleagues from other countries. Extremely worrying time for them. And so I think one of the most worrying aspects is if there is no agreement, what of their situation? And can we rely on UK politicians to protect their situation under national law? <coughs> well, they will be looking to reciprocity in that case to see what other countries might be doing in the case of UK nationals. Um, so I'm not sure about that. Okay. Okay. I'm going to finally talk about some other constitutional aspects of Brexit. So far, I've been talking about Britain negotiating with the EU, particularly with the Council, the Commission, and the European Parliament. But supposing we get a withdrawal agreement. So we get this agreement under Article 50. That's not an end to it, because then the fun starts, I think, because Britain's <coughs> relationship with the EU has to be unpicked because we've been members for 43 years, more than that by the time we get any agreement, EU law has become part of our national law. And we have to somehow remove it, or perhaps we do. The first way in which we remove it is to look to the European Communities Act, which is the gateway of EU law into national law. That would have to be repealed. That is what enables EU law to become directly effective in national law. That wouldn't be enough, though, because there are other ways in which EU law has penetrated our national law. Um, for example, we have enacted it in Acts of Parliament. It would have to be decided whether we wanted to keep those Acts of Parliament or not. Um, also, we have directly applicable EU laws which means that aspects of EU law are directly effective. They take effect immediately without any need for national law. Once we repeal the European Communities Act, they go. And these are important areas of law concerning a great variety of things, whether we are talking about the environment, whether we're talking about regulation of medicines, competition law, dumping law, or whether we're talking about protection of workers' rights, all of this will go. So there'll be huge, great gaps in our legal system, and something has to be done to replace that. Do we have sufficient civil servants in Whitehall parliamentarians, lawyers, well there always seem to be enough lawyers, uh, even if they are somewhat expensive, but somebody has to do all of this. And how are they going to do it? Will Parliament be sufficiently involved? So that is one worrying, specifically constitutional aspect. And the final constitutional aspect is that of the UK itself, the implications for devolution. And perhaps these are the most serious of all. The fact that we are four nations, and these four nations feel differently about the EU. And I think there are particularly worrisome aspects with Northern Ireland and Scotland. Northern Ireland has benefited hugely from EU membership. It has had a large amount of grants. Um, it voted in favour of remaining. We also have the Good Friday Agreement, signed between Britain and Ireland in 1998, which is an international treaty which is premised on EU membership of both countries. If Britain leaves the EU, I think that that treaty has to be, uh, has to be amended, has to be changed. Britain is in breach of it. It's now changing its relationship. So there is the serious question of what happens in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, there will be an external border running through um, Ireland, through the island of Ireland. 
And that has all sorts of very unpleasant connotations of the Troubles. That border has now all but vanished. You see very few traces of it. Would it have to be brought back? So that's one worrisome aspect. The other worrisome aspect is a particularly legal one, which is that EU law um, enters our system not just through the European Communities Act, but through the devolution statutes. Because all of the devolved legislatures must comply with EU law. I've set up one here, Scotland, which is typical. If they don't, if Scotland, for example, legislates in violation of EU law, that legislation is invalid. So if we leave the EU, that has to be changed. But the Scots don't want to leave the EU. So what will happen to that legislation? The Westminster Parliament, as a sovereign parliament, has the ability to revoke that. The Scotland Act is legislation of the Westminster Parliament. But we have a constitutional convention which governs that, the Sewell Convention, which says that Westminster would not normally act in any way that would affect this jurisdiction, and I can deal with that in more detail in questions if anybody's interested, without the consent of the devolved legislatures. Would they give their consent? Perhaps not. The suggestions that have been coming have been perhaps not. So this could prompt a constitutional crisis. And I think I'm running to the end of my time now, um, so I'm going to leave aside this very interesting question of the possibility of parts of the United Kingdom remaining within the EU, for example, Scotland. Could it remain within the EU and remain in the United Kingdom if England and Wales left the EU, but very happy to take questions on that point if anybody wants to raise it. So I think I would conclude by saying that actually Brexit is as interesting for matters of our constitution as it is for our relationship with the EU, because it really makes us think about what is the British constitution today? How does it function? If we believe that in trying to leave the EU, we are taking back control, taking back sovereignty, what does that mean? What does it mean if we say it's okay for the executive to go and withdraw in Brussels without consulting Parliament, for example? Surely the whole point was to give Parliament more power. But if Parliament is not going to be included in that, then what idea do we have of our constitution? And what about these devolved um, nations? How has the devolution of power to them affected how we see our constitution? So I think that there is a great deal of constitutional uncertainty and instability, not least in what we think referenda are for and whether they're binding or not. And in a sense, for me, that's been one of the most interesting aspects of this and one that will be pursued, I'm sure, for um, many weeks, months, and years to come. Mm -hmm.